Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. In the wake of the Saudi-Iranian agreement in March to reestablish diplomatic relations, Washington has sought to understand what's happening diplomatically in the Gulf. How do leaders understand their own security interests, and what role do they want the United States to play in the region? To break this down, I speak with a leading Middle East risk analyst, Ahem Kamel, of the Eurasia Group. Ahem travels frequently to the Gulf, and he's in close touch with many government officials and business leaders. Then I continue the conversation with my colleagues Will Todman and Danny Sharp, speaking about how the U.S. retrenchment from the Middle East is creating new opportunities for both the United States and the Gulf. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Ahem Kamel is the head of the Middle East and North Africa practice at the Eurasia Group, a risk consultancy, a job he's held since 2017. Ahem, welcome to Babel. It's been quite a tumultuous year in the Middle East. Oil prices have gone up. Oil importing states are feeling squeezed. The region is navigating its way through great power competition in the Ukraine. You spend a lot of time looking at the Gulf, in the Gulf, talking to people in the Gulf. What do you think the mood is in the Gulf right now? I think we've gone through several really stages, John. I think the initial phase was one of a shock that the U.S. is doing less in the region. The refreshing side of it is that regional powers, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, have begun to think about stage two. And what I feel is just a new sort of energy in the region that we are empowered, that this great power competition is not only a threat, it's an opportunity for us to draw our own course to gain more influence. I think that is why you're getting a lot of the regional initiatives, the UAE on several countries, the Saudis more recently on Iran and Syria. That would have been very, very difficult to imagine just 10 years ago when these issues would have been very closely coordinated with the United States. Is that Do you think a consequence of being disappointed in the United States, is it a consequence of seeing more opportunities? Is it a consequence of conceptualizing the region's role differently in terms of great power competition? I think in the initial phase, it was a level of uncomfort, lack of direction, scrambling to find alternatives to really think about how do you deal with this new environment? fundamentally different situation today, and it's more tilted towards the opportunity side. The Middle East's role in global geopolitics, I think that's where a lot of time is spent today by leaders in this region to think about, well, how do we position this region as a whole in a global order that is, I wouldn't say fragmenting, but just certainly evolving. And there are more, I think, concrete ideas. You see them in the UAE, you see them in Saudi. And the framework, I think, to think about over here is that power is going to be much more diffused. It isn't just the US and China. It's going to be the US, China, plus a host of countries that have influence in certain spheres. And this is where the Gulf countries particularly would like to play a role. I've been struck that the Indians in particular have talked about middle powers and the role of middle powers in global affairs. Do you see Middle Eastern governments thinking in terms of how they act as middle powers, what their role as middle powers should be, and how they should relate to other middle powers? I think on the last part of your question, yes, they've begun to think about how to interact with countries like India, like Brazil, like Israel, and less so when it comes to Russia. Do they have a very clear idea of how they would act as states in a global environment, middle power state? I don't think we're at that stage yet. But the policies are evolving. You can see some of the behavior, a lot more maturity than what you would have gotten two decades ago in terms of willingness to accept that they need to build long-term relationships with different countries that they might not agree with on many issues. 
I think it's going to be a journey, to be honest, and it's going to take them time to evolve into middle power status, but they're certainly taking the first steps in that direction. You talked about them thinking about the region broadly, and for the oil importing states in the region, conditions are turning quite scary. It's partly that they were hurt by COVID. It's partly that now they're paying more for commodities like oil, but also for food. A lot of them don't have the budgets that they were hoping for and to have a harder time accessing debt given the global financial environment. And we're seeing the Gulf states being much more reluctant to give easy assistance to states like Jordan and Egypt, certainly Lebanon. How does the Gulf think about the broader regional environment now? And as the Gulf is thinking about its own role, is it rethinking its relationship to the other countries in the Middle East as well? The Gulf, I think, has to a certain extent become comfortable with the position it has in Arab politics and MENA politics in general. There's really a shift in the center of gravity, at least in the Arab world away from North Africa, away from the Levant, towards the Gulf. These countries, these leaders, have become much more comfortable assuming that leadership role. On this level, initially, there was a bit of confidence that we control everything, our financial power, our military power is significantly larger, monarchies have survived the Arab Spring, other countries have not. And now I think you're getting to a different level where the Gulf begins to engage with North Africa and the Levant differently. In some ways, that's positive. In some ways, that's going to be challenging. The fundamental problem for the Gulf leaders, for MBS, for Mohammed bin Zayed, is that a lot of the countries that they're supporting have not changed their governance model, their economy, to make these states more viable long term. So on that level, I do think that they are right, that Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, they have structural issues that leaders there have not dealt with. So the funding issue becomes a, a core part of how they view that relationship. And the era of no strings attached is done. But I also remember when Egypt was in revolution, there was tremendous concern in the Gulf that we only have a few million people. The Egyptians have more than 100 million people. In fact, we have a few million Egyptians in our country. And if Egypt goes, the whole place goes up in flames. There seems to be less risk aversion about things going bad in Egypt and other places, or maybe there's less concern that Egypt is on the brink. How would you assess that? Egypt is not on the brink in the same way that it was after the Arab Spring. Things are better. There is a leadership there where the military at least is in firm control of the security environment. So pushing Egypt towards reform potentially could break it, but there's a good chance that it will not. And that's why I think the Gulf states are taking that risk. Do you think they would back off if there were signs of greater protest in Egypt? I think that they would adjust, absolutely. I think the threat, the challenge of 100 plus, 120 million Egyptians really in a very unstable environment creates a lot of challenges for the Gulf states. There is broad agreement that Egypt's collapse would be detrimental to everyone's interests. So I think once we get to a crisis level, you're going to see a very different policy, perhaps more flexibility from everyone. I am a bit surprised that it has gotten to this stage where there's such an aggressive push to get the Egyptians on a reform track fast after adjustment. Perhaps there's a disconnect on the level of tension on the Egyptian street. Because when I speak to people in Egypt today, I get the feeling that there is perhaps much more risk of instability, protests around really very not political reforms, but costs of living issues. To drill down a little bit more in Egypt, there is an argument that some people make that Sisi may be open to reform 
but the army is less open to reform. The army not only controls large parts of the economy, but the army also controls Sisi. And if Sisi really tried to take away from the army some of its economic powers, the army would take political power away from Sisi. Do you think that's overblown or do you think that there may be some truth to it? I think there's probably some truth to it that Sisi at the end of the day controls the system until he challenges the core interests of the military and then they have enough incentive to begin to challenge him in different places. The challenge for the Gulf is if you think about the Egyptian military coming up with an alternative for Sisi, then you're dealing with the same structure, vested interest in control of the system. If you think about Sisi and the way he, that he has governed Egypt, there have been economic mistakes. The Egyptian military wants its gems to be protected, and Sisi wants to build his capital that has cost tens of billions of dollars. So you really don't have a lot of options there. And certainly what the Gulf countries would not want to see is really a popular uprising, really a shift into a democratic Egypt in the same way that we've seen in the past. So they're stuck with very difficult choices. Where else is the Gulf focused in the region? As you say, a lot of interest in Egypt and a lot of interest in pushing reform. There seems to be an interest on the one hand in having Tunisia not lapse into Islamist-led democracy, but also not rewarding Kais Saeed that much for having a less democratic, more authoritarian push. Where else is the Gulf focus in the region? As far as I see it, I think the Gulf is beginning to reimagine its relationship with North Africa and the Levant, and there's going to be much more interest, according to new terms, definitely according to new terms. But the phase of isolationism, where the Gulf really runs the show and is more focused on big power politics, I think we're a bit beyond that. The new push or the new phase is one where there is engagement in North Africa and the Levant to create a broader sea of maybe not stability, but less instability. So we will see, I think, more interests in not only Tunisia, not only Egypt, and not only Jordan. You're beginning to see that with Syria. You're definitely seeing that with Iraq. I think to a certain extent, Tunisia will get more attention once we get into a crisis environment. And the foundation of all of that is going to be based on, I think, several things. One is preventing an Arab Spring moment. Oil importing countries have much more of a difficult environment. They can't borrow. They've been hit by COVID. They've been hit by Russia, Ukraine. So really the seeds of a regional uprising, they're there. And the generation that saw the pains of the Arab Spring, perhaps you have some young people that didn't experience that or weren't as aware of that. Certainly the issue for Iraq where no one even remembers at this point, young Iraqis do not remember the era of Saddam Hussein. They've had 20 plus years. And there are a lot of young Iraqis. And a lot of them politically active, savvy. They understand. They are involved. So you have the seeds of that in the region. The second aspect I, I would say is that for the Gulf countries, they're thinking about an economic model where they diversify, where, where there is more room to grow their economic potential. A sea of instability around these countries fundamentally weakens their attractiveness for foreign investors, for local investors as well. So they need a bit of stability in the places that are close to them in Egypt and Syria and Iraq as well. How do you think they'll deal with Palestine over the next five to 10 years? <sighs> I think that the Palestinian issue is the one that they would prefer not to handle. This is- Likely to have a political transition in the next five to 10 years. Absolutely. First of all, I don't think there's coherence within the Gulf on how they would want to handle Palestine. Intra-Gulf competition is also playing a role. I think you're beginning to see a much less enthusiastic Saudi Arabia in regards to normalization with Israel, which is going to be a factor that they leverage in terms of their distinct foreign policy from the UAE. There is no, I think, uniform policy on how they would handle a post-Abbas <laughs> world. And that world is going to be 
much more unstable. No firm conviction, I think, on their part on Palestine. But the issues, I think, shift away from the trend that we've seen a few years ago where it was normalization, normalization, normalization towards a trend of taking care of Palestinian interests and the way that they're perceived more broadly in, in the Middle East. A key moment, I think, coincidentally, which is sort of strange that leaders didn't think about this before, but the World Cup in Qatar was quite important in reminding leaders that actually their populations are not sold on normalization. The support for Morocco, Palestinian flags across different stadiums, you really saw that this issue, the Palestinian issue, still captures the hearts of minds of at least a significant portion of their populations. One of the other issues that's been fanning regional instability is Iran's support for proxies throughout the region. Do you expect that the resumption of diplomatic relations is going to make a, a distinct change in how Iran thinks about its regional proxy policy? Or do you expect the Iranians are going to continue to use whatever tools they have to remind people that they're present and need to be dealt with? I think we're probably in the pause and relax mode for regional policy. There is a pattern, I think, of Iranian behavior on the proxy side, which is, I think, to go through phases, expand, pause, rebuild, expand. I think we're in the pause phase. And this stage is very different as well because of China's involved in diplomacy. There are two theories around Chinese diplomatic outreach in the Middle East, that China is grabbing a quick win, very nice to sign agreements between Iran and Saudi Arabia, but really it will not be able to curb Iranian proxy expansion if Iran decides to. The second, I think, is one where I lean towards, is that actually China has a vested interest in calming down Saudi Iranian tensions and has sufficient leverage at this moment because it's basically the most important economic exit, foreign exchange lever for Iran. But they have to be willing to use that leverage. Absolutely. And I think for them, expanding, creating a brand of diplomacy where they have influence, not only in the Middle East, diplomatic influence in a lot of places where the U.S., had influence, is important enough for them to use some of that leverage. Will they use their full power? No. Will the Iranians accept that they need to put back all the proxies back in place? No. But I think the structural factors, what I'm hearing from negotiations in Yemen, also the Saudi position has changed on that. It points to a phase where there's a bit of relaxation, a little bit of more constructive engagement. I want to go back to what you were talking about, about the U.S. role in great power competition. I certainly hear a lot of skepticism in the Gulf toward the Biden administration. How much of that is about the Biden administration in particular? How much of it is an assessment that the United States as a country has made a decision about the energy transition and made a decision that in a fundamental strategic way the United States doesn't have nearly the same interest in the Gulf than it used to. And the United States, Republicans or Democrats, are going to be moving away from this part of the world. I think that the heart says for them it's a Biden issue. The mind says it's a structural U.S. position in global politics, in Middle East politics. And I think they're acting based on the structural factor. Initially, I would, I would say that there was interest in finding a way for them to rekindle the relationship and get the U.S. to commit a search for strategic defense treaties from the UAE, from Saudi Arabia. I think today they're not interested in that. I think today they've come to realize that in a world where democratic Republican politics is going to shift back and forth, and create issues for them in a world where energy transition is a big headline, in a world where the US has to pick and choose where it needs to expand influence, which continent, which theater, the Middle East is not going to be a top priority and they're acting on it. 
Do you think golf publics have fully absorbed the fact that the energy transition is coming and is going to change things? And do you think they have an understanding of the impact the energy transition will have on their lives? No. I think that this is a very difficult issue to handle, to digest, for the populations to begin to think about. We are only at the beginning of a process where even the leaders are able to adjust their economic models. I think it's going to be very difficult for a public that is not actually politically engaged. Gulf public is not politically engaged on key issues. They were not asked on key policy issues, foreign or domestic. The transition, I think, is going to be a very difficult one across the Gulf because one, it will probably happen faster than what governments and certainly what the public expects. And two, the public is unwilling to give up on the welfare model. And the level of immigration, the level of foreign workers in a lot of these Gulf economies will create social tensions. You will still need foreign workers across the Gulf. And increasingly, I worry that some of the pains of transition will be blamed on foreign workers, not energy transition. It's a final question. You spent a lot of time thinking about the Gulf and transitions and changes and all those things. What do you think is the most important thing that people are missing when they think about the Gulf and what's going on in the Gulf right now? I think what people are missing is that there is going to be a big reset. I think the grand reset in Gulf international, regional relationship that might not move in the direction in the way that we're thinking about today. One, it might not necessarily be linear. There might be shocks in the way that leaders react to their effort to diversify their geopolitical relationships. There might be economic shocks that really pose challenges to the oil importing countries in a way that the Arab Spring created a shock for a lot of us when we observed it. And I think that the Middle East is perhaps one of the least prepared regions for a digital transformation where jobs are just not as readily available for your average population and you're struggling to adapt. This is a region that is beginning to think also about its relationship within Turkey, Iran, and the Arab countries, and Israel, in a way that was, I think, very difficult to imagine in the past. We are getting this reset. It will be a bumpy one. And I'm not sure it will be a more stable one, but it certainly will be different from the world that we've witnessed in the last 50 years. I am Camel. I always enjoy talking to you, and thanks very much for joining us on Babel. My pleasure. Thank you, John. That was a fascinating conversation that covered a lot of ground. So I'd like to zoom in on something that stuck out to me. Iham took your original question, John, and he somewhat reframed it. He alluded three times to the Gulf increasingly seeing the U.S. exit not as some catastrophic risk, but as actually an opportunity. As a program, we define ourselves as producing opportunity-driven rather than threat-driven analysis. So that struck a chord with me. Arguably, we're starting to see some of the effects of the Gulf's opportunity mindset already with China, Saudi, Iran deal. But what do Gulf states need to do to succeed in taking advantage of that opportunity moving forward? What would success look like in five, 10 years' time? So I think the, the first thing is I think the next five or 10 years are more likely to meet with a lot of success than sort of in 20 years. And all the leaders in the Gulf now, except for in Kuwait, expect to be in power in 20 years. And so the real challenge is not how do you use what I expect is going to be a windfall from the early stages of the energy transition. But as I have talked about, how do you pivot the population to different kinds of expectations? about what life will be like in the energy transition. 
How do they feel that the energy transition is an opportunity? How do you reformulate the relationship between the government and the population? Those aren't five or 10 year challenges. There will be five or 10 year challenges. And the governments are dealing with five or 10 year challenges. And everybody has a 2030 plan and people have 2035 plans. But to me, a lot of the really hard things start 2035, 2040. And a lot of these leaders expect to be in power then. And that's when they're going to have to make hard choices. And now is when you have to start laying the groundwork for where you want to be. They have the advantage that you have a more unitary government, you have smaller populations, they can afford to be more agile, but they're really trying to attempt a change in direction that is going to be harder than getting people to embrace life with a lot more money. This is going to be getting people to embrace life with a lot less money. I agree on the domestic level. Thinking about the international level, what I would view as success in terms of navigating the changing balance of power is partly not alienating any of the great powers through their increased relations with all of them, you know, not doing something with China that really gets the ire of Washington, perhaps also developing a degree of distance from them. And what I mean by that is having the great powers not view the foreign policies of Gulf states, for example, not viewing them in terms of just their relationships with other great powers, but in pursuit of their own interests. And, you know, this reminds me of the US response to the OPEC decision last year to cut oil. And certainly in here in Washington, a lot of the reaction from you know, senior Democrats from parts of the administration was, this is terrible that Saudi Arabia has chosen Russia in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, rather than seeing this as this is Saudi Arabia trying to pursue its own economic interests. And it needs oil prices, I think, to be $76 per barrel in order to break even for its budget. And, you know, the Saudi response was, this is not about Russia. This is about domestic economics. So to me, some of this is about, you know, being able to pursue their own interests and take steps that might, you know, work against the interests of some great powers, but sort of be able to get away from that. Maybe another part of what success looks like that's linked to this is changing reputation. I think the UAE has often been described as a little Sparta and, you know, a very small country that punches above its weight. And I suspect that the UAE does not want to be seen in those terms and that it actually wants to be considered as a serious player regionally and globally and to be treated as such. And so, you know, as particularly Gulf states start to maneuver more on the international stage, I think they want their reputation to change at the same time. And then I think if it does, they would view that as a success. Both of these things that you're describing will strike me as like sort of broad perceptual shifts. Does that happen in five, 10 years? And whether it does or doesn't, how do you get there? I mean, how do you change the way that the United States reacts to something that Saudi does and the terms in which it views it? So partly you're going to have different administrations. So part of what the Saudis and the Emiratis and others are, are waiting for is when the U.S. changes. But I think you see the Emirates seeking to use COP as a way to plant some new flags, to start some new initiatives, to start some new conversations. Uh, I think, as I am talked about, Qatar was able to use the World Cup to set some understandings about Qatar, some of which were positive, some of which were negative. But I think that a lot of these governments do think that, yeah, you can't, change everything overnight, but you can be pretty agile, especially if you have the resources, especially when you have a small population that you can genuinely lead. And one of the things that I've been really interested in is the way countries like the Emirates have used things like Special Olympics, have used things like conscription, 
to move their own population quickly into new directions. Special Olympics, in my mind, in the UAE, is not really about greenwashing and, and convincing the world that the UAE is a wonderful humanitarian place. It might have some of that effect. But I think they're engaging with Special Olympics is because there's a huge problem of birth defects in the UAE because there's so much consanguinity, so many people are marrying close relatives that you end up a lot of people with birth defects and people who were an, considered an embarrassment, they were institutionalized, and the leadership decided that the way we're going to address this is we're going to change the way our country thinks about it. And they led the population partly through an international effort, but partly through domestic effort to change the way people talk about what they now call people of determination, a phrase which was created in the UAE and then adopted by the National Special Olympics Organization. Mm -hmm. This is the UAE saying, we have a million people, we can move a million people, and this is how we're going to do it. And they have the money and they have the confidence of their people to actually lead. And so when you think about how these governments are thinking, they see themselves naturally as being more empowered because all the messiness of getting something to move in the United States with 330 million people and competing views, for better and for worse, that's not the way these places work. That is very interesting. And I wonder if we can get some of that same inspiration on the flip side here. If we borrow IHAM's reframing for the United States as well, I know we spend a lot of time talking about what the United States stands to lose by drawing down in the Middle East. But just like we were talking about before, are there non-obvious ways in which the U.S. could find benefit in a reduced presence? And an example that I sort of thought of was maybe through putting greater emphasis on multilateralism, the U.S. can do things with its partners that mean smaller draw on blood and treasure for the United States with the same outcome. I think that exact argument is why there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill across the US and in some other think tanks in DC as well who think that a reduced US presence in the region would be a very positive thing. But to me, one of the opportunities of a lighter presence would be more a redefinition of the value add that the United States brings in international relations and has as a partner. Perhaps part of the challenge of being so heavily involved across the region is that you end up, you know, having some role in, in sort of everything across the board. And so you lose sight of what it is that the US has a unique role to do and a unique, you know, competitive strategic advantage. So I hope that some of this process will be about working out what are those things. And I would argue that it is a very difficult process to do that and that Europe has not done well at doing this. You know, Europe has essentially had to try and do this. It, it previously played, European states previously played a much bigger role in the region. They still today have a lot of interventions across the MENA region. You know, they are a significant economic trade partner. They are a significant aid partner, both humanitarian aid and development aid. But what is the true European value add? I don't really know. And I think they feel sort of obliged to keep going. It's very difficult for European states, the EU, to cut back on some of their interventions. So I'm not saying this would be an easy process, but I think it's a really important one. And I think it could lead to shifts in reputations as well. And I take your point, this is tough to do in the short term. But thinking in the longer term, the United States certainly needs to work on its reputation in the region. And being more specific about what it does and what it doesn't do could be a way to, to get to that. You know, the Bush administration seemed to spend a lot of time after 9-11 trying to inspire people in the Middle East. And it seemed to me that if you're actually paying attention, people in the Middle East had aspirations. They just didn't think the United States was relevant to achieving them. And it seems to me that there's some humility involved in recognizing what are the aspirations and what's the role we can play. And I think if we start from that position, that we don't have to tell people what they want, 
we have to help them get what they want, that that leads to a healthier relationship and a relationship that does involve less blood and treasure, a relationship that does advance reputations, and ultimately a relationship that helps create a more secure region, which serves the interests of both people in the region and and the United States. And an opportunity-driven approach as well, which, as you said, is something that we're fond of in this program. Yes, indeed. (laughs) Excellent. Well, John, Will, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Danny. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Babbel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSIS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.